on News Hour tonight. Independent marketers threaten shutdown in northeast over alleged harassment by customs. Troops neutralize bandits in Kaduna village as gunmen abduct Catholic priests in Zamfara. Atiku's visit to Buhari in Daura stirs political tension. Now the foreign in Togo leaves suspension on foreign journalist accreditations. Hello and welcome to Trust TV's News Hour. I am Chiamaka Mwafo. The news. The Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria has issued a stern warning threatening to shut down all petroleum filling stations in Adamawa and Taraba states. This action is in response to what the association describes as harassment of its members by officers of the Nigerian Customs Service. Gibson Swadigo reports. Speaking at a press conference, the chairman of the Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria for Adamawa and Taraba states, Tairubuwa, expressed the association's frustration over alleged harassment of its members by the Nigerian Customs Service. He accused the NCS anti smuggling unit, known as Operation Wild Wind, of abandoning their designated border operations to target legitimate businesses within the metropolitan and local government areas. This, he claimed, has resulted in financial losses, artificial scarcity, and increased price of petroleum products. Confiscating and importing of our petroleum tanker trucks and sealing of filling stations by these men of the Nigerian Customs Services. This act is unacceptable and unreasonable to us, hence has led to one financial losses by petroleum marketers, artificial scarcity of petroleum products in the states, high in prices of product consumers due to non availability of petroleum supplies by, by our members. Number four, crippling of the state economy, which this government has worked tirelessly to curtail. In a bid to seek resolution, Boba called on National Security Advisor. No Rivado, Governor Amal Murfintri of Adamawa State, and Governor Kefas Abu of Taraba State to intervene. He warned that if their concerns are not addressed by June 25, 2024, all petroleum product stakeholders will initiate an industrial action. To step in as the matter of urgency and of public interest to do the needful by calling the men of the Nigerian Customs Service to order so as to quench the escalation that may probably lead to industrial actions by all the stakeholders of petroleum products, which are Iman, NATO, and all branches of UPE, which include PTD, IND, PSW, ELD, and Sutaket, etc. Recently, the NSC Comptroller General Bashir Adewale Adeni revealed that within two weeks of its inauguration, Operation Wild Wind seized 150,000. 950 liters of petroleum valued at over 105 million naira nationwide. Gibson Soadgo, Trust TV News, Yola. Most security stories where troops of the Nigerian army have neutralized several bandits in a fresh coordinated attack in Giwa local government area of Kaduna State. The coordinated ground and airstrikes by troops of Operation Well Punch successfully neutralized several bandits, including some of their leaders at an identified meeting point near Bula community within Yadi Forest in Giwa local government area. According to operational feedback to the Kaduna State government released by the State Commission of Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Aruan, the strike was based on credible intelligence which followed the recent elimination of some bandit kingpins along the Kaduna Katina border areas. Aruan said intelligence report had earlier revealed that bandits were to converge at the area for a meeting on a deadly mission within the Yadi Forest General Area before they were dislodged by troops of Operation World Punch. Receiving the report, the Kaduna State Governor, Senator Obasani, expressed his satisfaction and commended the security forces for their quick response, diligent effort, and precise execution. The Governor thanks the various sources who provided crucial intelligence leading to the successful strike. Southern security Shabu community has been thrown into confusion following the kidnapping 
of Musa Shoaibu, the murder king of Shabu community in Lafia, local government area of Nasarawa state, by yet to be identified gunmen. The gunmen were said to have stormed the area at about 8 p.m. on Thursday night and whisked him away to a yet to be identified location. A source from the area who craved anonymity said Shoaibu was kidnapped a few meters away from his residence after observing his Muslim Ishai prayers in a mosque in the area. The police public relations officer in the state, PPRO DSP Ramhan Nansel, who confirmed the incident to journalists in Lafia, said personnel of the command had been drafted to the area to ensure that the chief is rescued unhurt and to apprehend the criminal elements. Still in security over in Zamfara State, suspected bandits have kidnapped the parish priest of St. Raymond Catholic Church, Damba, Reverend Father Mika Suleiman, in the Guzal area of the state. The spokesperson of Zamfara State Police Command, Yazid Abubakar, said Father Mika was kidnapped around 3 a.m. on Saturday at his residence in the Damba area of Guzal. He noted that although the incident was not reported to the police, the command has however deployed a police tactical squad to trail the kidnappers and to ensure his safe return. The acting chancellor of the Catholic Diocese of Sokoto, the very reverend father Nuhu Ilya, in a statement on Saturday, confirmed the abduction. All is now set for the Northwest Regional Summit on Insecurity to be hosted by Katsina State Government, United Nations Development Funds, UNDP, and other partners. The two-day regional summit, which is expected to address banditry and other security challenges bedelving the Northwest, is scheduled for Monday 24th and Tuesday 25th, June 2024. Abdullah Yamedi tells us more. This is the first time since banditry and other security challenges peaked in the region that the leadership of the Northwestern region is coming together as a body to seek avenues of addressing them. The Kazanah State Commissioner for Information and Culture, while briefing newsmen on the development said the regional block summit is expected to strengthen cooperation and understanding among various stakeholders on security. These issues have had devastating consequences for the local population. Reversing in significant loss of life, severe disruption to livelihood, and widespread destruction of properties. This underscores the urgent need for coordinated action and solution to restore peace and stability in the region. Stakeholders say, the summit is timely considering the thousands of lives lost and property worth billions of naira destroyed over the last decade. This effort led to the decision to convene this high level peace and security summit for the Northwest government. By bringing together key stakeholders, this summit is expected to serve as a platform for meaningful dialogue and action. Besides the issue of insecurity, the summit is also expected to come out with ways of addressing other key problems such as humanitarian crisis, communal disharmony, ensure support for victims of violence, as well as conflict resolution efforts, among others. Public commentators who see the summit as a starting point towards addressing the common challenge confronting the region are appealing to other partners, especially the media, to remain committed in holding leaders accountable for the overall development of the country. Abdullahi Izumayamadi, Trust Television News, Katsina. Still in Katana, but on the political scene, trouble may be brewing in the People's Democratic Party in the state if nothing is done to save the situation, as some members are claiming that a factional loyal, that a faction rather, loyal to the 2023 governorship candidate Yakubu Lado has hijacked forms meant for congresses. The members who claim to be the bona fide members of the party in the state lamented that they were assigned to purchase farms for wards, local governments and state congresses at the PDP headquarters, but members of the Kerchika committee were nowhere to be found. Again, Abdullah Yamadi tells us more. 
Some members of the main opposition party who claimed to be the party's major stakeholders while briefing newsmen said, though sales of firms has begun since 3rd of June and is expected to end on the 24th of June, they have not been able to purchase them due to what they termed hide-and-seek games on the part of members of the state caretaker committee who are claiming they are not aware of any exercise in that regard. Aruna. Eh, <laughs> <laughs> So, to Alhamdulillah, Mungode, members of the caretaker committee are all not there except one. He's a member of the caretaker committee. The administrative secretary of the party is not here, though we've spoken with him on phone. He said he's not aware of any exercise concerning the sales of forms. They are aware that the forms have since left Abuja to Kazana but lamented that the caretaker committee members who are allegedly loyal to Yakubu Ladu Damariki have not been on seat for the exercise as at 19th June 2024, a situation the stakeholders described as unfair and unacceptable. The exercise is not taking place in Kazana, so we don't know what is happening, but we we'll continue to monitor the situation and then we decide on the next line of action. While fielding questions from journalists, a member of the aggrieved members, Salis Uli, said they will continue to monitor the process and make an informed decision in due course. The PDP in Kasna has been enmeshed in series of crises since 2015 when it lost the state to all progressives Congress, APC. Political observers say the party is yet to recover from the recent defection of the former governor Ibrahim Shema along with hundreds of his supporters to the ruling All Progressives Congress APC. Efforts to speak with the members of the State Caretaker Committee of the PDP in Kazna proved abortive as at the time of compiling this report. The main opposition party, according to political watchers, need to re-strategize at least to live up to its status as a viable opposition to the ruling all progressives congress apc leadership not only in the state but the country as a whole abdullahi Yamadi, trust television news kazana people's democratic party pdp presidential candidate in the 2023 election atiku abubakar on Saturday, visited former President Muhammad Buhari at his residence in Daura Katsina State. A video of the visit showed that the former governor of Sokoto State, Aminu Tambawa, was part of Atiku's entourage. The visit is coming barely three days after Atiku visited former military heads of state, Ibrahim Babangida and Abdul Salami Abubakar, in their respective residences in Mina. United States. The visits have heightened speculations that Atiku is preparing ground to contest the 2027 presidential election. In May, Atiku had vowed to continue contesting for the presidency as long as he's healthy. He made a declaration amid moves to form a coalition with his counterpart from Labour Party, Pitobi, and other political parties. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Move down south to River State, where the Nigerian Labour Congress and the Trade Union Congress in the state have asked personnel of the Nigerian police who took over local government secretariats in the state to vacate the council premises. They made the demand following an emergency state administrative council meeting at the NLC secretariat in Port Harcourt, the River State capital. Here's more of the story. The meeting addressed three key issues, namely the constitution inauguration of Ketika committees in the 23 local government areas, the call by the All Progressives Congress APC for a state of emergency in the state, and the police takeover of council secretariats. The state NLC chairman, Alex Awanwo, acknowledged the police's efforts to maintain peace, but stated that denying workers access to their offices is a breach of their rights. He urged the Inspector General of Police, IGP, Kayade Betokun, to instruct the River State Commissioner of Police, Olatunji Disu, to grant workers access to their offices to carry out their legitimate duties. However, the council is session France seriously that is three of the 23 local government council secretary by men and officers of the Nigerian police force for the reason of maintaining law and order, thereby locking up our members for performing their statutory duties. While the council of both NSC and TEC acknowledges the statutory responsibility of the Nigerian police in maintaining law and orders, it is also important for such functions to be exercised in a manner that workers in this instance are not deprived to assess their duty posts. Both NS and TC call on this petitioner of police to immediately direct the Commissioner of Police River State Command to allow legitimate workers of the various local government councils to assess their offices. Regarding the APC's call for a state of emergency, the NLC chief said such a demand is not in the best interest of the state. The CUC chairman, Ike Chuku Onyefuru, also provided insight on why it is illogical to call for a state of emergency in River State. The council in session anonymously condemned in strong terms the purported call for a state of emergency in River State by some supposed political leaders of the state, which in all ramifications do not wish River State people well. While we appreciate people's rights to self opinion, it is also important not to allow our self centeredness override our sense of uh, reasoning. We challenge all our detractors. Let them come out and give us one state in Nigeria that have even agreed that they will do 80,000 naira minimum wage. What federal government is doing 62? Lagos is doing 70. Some states are, are, are struggling with 30. River State is the only state where local government workers are taking minimum wage of 130,000 naira. Other states, or local government, are still taking 80,000. <laughs> understand all this. River State is the only state in Nigeria today where the governor is currently constructing 20,000 housing units for workers. That project is ongoing. We challenge all the other states. Show us what your governor is doing. So why will people continue to the market River State? Meanwhile, the Civil Liberties Organization, CLO, and over 40 affiliate organizations have threatened to embark on a statewide protest if the Inspector General of Police, IGP Kayode Egbetoku, refuses to withdraw his men from the 23 local government councils in River State. This is the News Hour on Trust TV. Still to come. A cultural practice gradually facing a way due to generational shift. More news when we return. Please do stay with us. This is Trust TV, documenting the Nigerian story. The Northwest Governors Forum, in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, welcomes you to a two-day Northwest Peace and Security Summit with the theme, Regional Cooperation for Securing Lives and Livelihoods in Northwest Nigeria. Keynote speaker, His Excellency Bola Ahmed Tinubu, GCFR, President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Federal Republic of Nigeria, host governors, Governor Diko Omorada, Kasina State, and Chairman, Northwest Governors Forum, Governor Obasani, Kaduna State, Governor Dauda Lawal, Zamfara State, Governor Abba Kabir Yusuf, Kano State, Governor Umar Namadi, Jigawa State, Governor Nasir Idris, Kebbi State, 
and Governor Ahmad Aliu, Sokoto State. Date, June 24th and 25th, 2024. Venue, Casino State Government House. Time, 9 a.m. daily. Media Partner, Media Trust Group. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us and just joining us as the news hour on Trust TV. A recap of our top stories. We told you that independent marketers threatened shutdown in Northeast over alleged harassment by customs. We also let you know that troops neutralize more bandits in Kaduna village as bandits kidnap Catholic priests in Samfara. Tomorrow's story. Governor Arba Yusuf of Kano has called on security agencies to take decisive action against the growing menace of thuggery in the state. The governor who made the call during the 15th weekly meeting of the Kano Executive Council at the Government House on Friday expressed concern over the recent surge in violent activities in certain parts of the Kano metropolis. In a statement issued on Saturday by Sanusi Tofa, his spokesperson, Governor Arba, expressed his disapproval of the escalating clashes involving Yanba, Yandaba gangs. Governor Abba emphasized the state government's ongoing efforts to collaborate with security agencies to safeguard the lives and properties of Kanu residents. Addressing the judiciary, the governor cautioned against the premature release of individuals involved in Thurgery. The governor also issued a stern warning to security agencies, urging them to focus strictly on their mandated duties. The Federal High Court seating in Lagos on Friday ordered the final forfeiture to the federal government pro properties valued at over 11.14 billion naira and another 1.04 billion naira linked to the former Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN Governor Godwin Emefiele. Justice Chukuji Kwaneke made the order of permanent forfeiture after hearing an application filed and argued by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission through its counsel, Chinenye Okezie. On June 5, 2024, the judge had upheld the anti-graft agency's motion filed and argued by its counsel, Rutimi Oyedepo SAN, for a temporary forfeiture of the properties. Oyedepo informed the court that MFLA was suspected of having bought the choice properties by proxy for the proceeds of fraud. The FCC named two current and one former CBN staff as MFLA's accomplices in the alleged fraud. The properties are mostly located in hybrid parts of the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, Abuja. They include shops and apartments at Cadastral Zone, Meitama and Use. What matters, the legal state government says the number of fatalities from the cholera outbreak in the state has risen to 35 following the latest update which reported 401 suspected cases and 15 fatalities. At the last count, the government said Lagos Island, Kosofe and Etiosa recorded the highest numbers. But in the latest update on his Instagram handle on Saturday, the State Commissioner for Health, Akin Abayomi, said the number of confirmed cases in the nation's commercial capital is now 417. On Thursday, the World Health Organization announced a spike in cholera in several regions of the world with almost 195,000 cases and over 1,900 deaths reported in 24 countries since the start of 2024. According to the WHO, the Eastern Mediterranean region reported the highest number of cases, followed by the African region, the region of the Americas, the Southeast Asia region and the European region. Still on the cholera outbreak, the Kano state government has advised residents against drinking rainwater to prevent the spread of the disease. The advice was contained in a statement on Saturday by the head of the Public Relations Unit, Ministry of Health, Ibrahim Abdullahi, and issued to newsmen on Saturday. Abdullahi said the advice was necessary because usually the rainy season comes with cholera complications, which some states in the country have already fallen victim to. He urged residents to always wash vegetables and fruits thoroughly with clean water before consumption as they are mostly 
purchased from the market where they are not properly washed. He said Governor Abra Yusuf's administration will continue to give all the needed attention to the health care of the people of the state, adding that health is one of the aspects that the governor accords maximum priorities. Still on the outbreak, the minority leader of the House of Representatives, Kingsley Chinda, has called on the federal government to declare a state of emergency on cholera outbreak in the country. Chinda will make the call in a statement on Saturday, stressing the need for coordinated joint stakeholders' action against the outbreak to nip it in the bud. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control at CDC had earlier announced the outbreak of the waterborne disease in 30 states of the Federation. Chinda stated that the outbreak highlights critical deficiencies in public health safety measures and undiscuss the need for immediate action. According to him, lack of adequate investment in public and personal health education has contributed significantly to the spread of preventable diseases. He added that as schools across the nation resume from the recent public holidays, there is an urgent need to declare a state of emergency on cholera. In Benue State, residents of the state capital, Mercordi, are still counting their losses after a torrential downpour that caused flooding as well as collapse of residential buildings. Jimmy Azende reports that this has become a perennial problem in some parts of the state whenever there is a heavy downpour. Here's a report. Most residential areas in the state capital are not planned in a manner that enables easy flow of rainwater during heavy downpours. Hence, some devastating consequences when it rains heavily. Many of them, their houses and their fences have actually fallen. We are calling upon street. the government or whoever had has assigned this project to make sure that the what was expected to be done is done, so that the people will actually not be affected the way it is. It is. It is right now. We understand that the flow that has, the rain that has fallen today because of this because of what has been docked here. Residents here are suffering the consequence of poor urban planning that may have been avoided if the right thing was done. I've been here for the past uh, 15, 20 years, and this thing has been happening. The much of it have been drained here now, they have always been a, a, a different things we see. This one is too heavy. We need the government to come to our head and dig uh, water by the side this way and this way so that. The water will be taken to Riverside. And actually, it's getting worse as some fences are even down and buildings almost collapsing like this. So actually, I want to urge the contractors to hurry up and look into the case. Observers say both the government and residents have a lot to do for the environment to avoid such disasters. The race happened, began in earnest and flood has actually taken place. Uh, I would advise that people don't build on water channels and then the government should also arise to this responsibility to ensure that before people erase structures, they follow the proper guidelines in order to avert further consequences of flood. With NAMIC prediction, it seems residents have more to worry in this year's rainy season as heavy downpours are expected in the weeks ahead. Jimmy Azandi Trust TV News, Mark Odi. The Delta State Government Task Force on Land Recovery has continued its demolition exercise with buildings and 74 axes of unwind going down. The task force has the mandate of the state government to reclaim land around the state. This round of demolition affected a hotel, supermarket, schools, shops and residential homes. Tears flowed freely as both landlords and tenants whose appeal for more time when futility watched helplessly as their properties were brought down. Some tried to salvage what they could before the bulldozers got to work. This school was allowed to close for the day to allow the students evacuate the building before demolition. Chairman of the task force, Frank Omari, said the state government has declared war against land grabbers in the state. From the beginning, the various Agencies have told them this is government land, and they undermine it. Since Kefas, since Jeff's Ivory time, since Uduaga's time, since Okowa's time, now in Sheriff's time. 
So it's, it's not, we are not, please, nobody. We are looking for the land grabbers. We are looking for those leaders who has misinformed the less privileged in this country. How can you sell government land? There are a lot of them that are run away, but government is going, is going after them. We still need uh, help from government to give us accommodation because we can't live without home. And I passed out April here. Last, I think last two months, I gathered money to open that boutique. And now this is happening. Everything has gone down. I suggest the government should have take possession of it as the landlords that own this place to come and make the document official. Tell them what to pay and tell them how to acquire it legally instead of demolition. You reset the land for them and do any other thing. It's better. This country is so hard. For you know one that have really earned so much to build an house here. Every year in Nigeria, thousands of students have turned out of the nation's tertiary institutions, but most of them seeking vacant positions to occupy in an almost saturated labor market. Governments, both at the federal and state levels, have repeatedly said the ratio of available jobs to fresh graduates seeking employment is so disproportionate that unless a greater chunk of graduates seek entrepreneurship, unemployment will continue to rise. In Gombe, 33-year-old Abubakar Adamo, in line with the government's position, is advocating entrepreneurship among the young graduates, warning that the era of white-collar jobs is gradually fading. Hassan Kohli has more. On a daily basis, Adamo Abubakar is goes to Gombe Men Market, where he sells poultry for a living. <laughs> He is now advocating for youths to focus on building their own businesses rather than looking for paid jobs. Currently, agriculture education, BSc. I studied agricultural education and graduated in 2018. When I came back home, I realized that getting a government job will not be easy. So I ventured into the chicken business here in Gombe, main market. In fact, that was the best decision I made because it pays my bill. To me, everyone has to use what they learn in school to distinguish themselves from those who never attended formal education. Adamu won't graduate against relying on government jobs, saying the current economic realities will not be easy for both the government and graduates. With the current economic condition, students must combine studies and skills development or start a small-scale business. This will help them sustain their lives during studies and after graduation. It is unfortunate that most of the students nowadays become liabilities after graduation simply because they don't have any skills and have not ventured into any business enterprise. I am advising students, especially youth, to look at how to become self-employed because from my experience, being self-employed is far better than most paid jobs. According to University World News Records, 600,000 graduates are produced each academic year in Nigeria, which is worrisome as it translates to a bulging youthful, energetic and employed population with no contribution to the economic growth of the country. From Gombe, Hassan Kohli, reporting for Trust TV. Tribal Max is an old practice in Nigeria among different tribes, clan, hamlet or people with a particular trade. However, the old practice is gradually disappearing due to civilization and other factors. Trusty Visbelo Musa spoke to parents and other residents who shared their views on the relevance or otherwise of tribal marks in this era. Here's his report. Traditionally, tribal marks are made by cutting or scaring the skin with sharp instruments. The process is mostly done during infancy or early childhood by the local barbers in the communities. The aim is to give tribal a sense of identity and belonging among people. 
Fulani daiki daiki ne. The Fulanis are of different clan, family, and race. So marks in the face reveal the identity of where each Fulani come from and their clan. Even our animals used to have marks in them for identification. I did not do marks for my children because now things have changed. In the olden days, it was used for identification. I have two boys and four girls and none of them are wearing tribal marks. Tribal marks is also used for beautification and in some cases for inoculation against childhood disease or spiritual attack. The ancient practice is however fast fading out. Nowadays, people see it as uncivilized practice, though it makes some people look beautiful. Now, many factors discourage the practice like religion of Islam. For now, it's no longer relevant. And the reasons why it's no longer relevant is probably due to civilizations, probably due to people tend to change those norms that we normally have probably in the forms of identifications. Now you find out that people, one person can hear different languages. So you don't need a tribal mark to be able to identify where he comes from. Local barbers used to be the traditional healer in the communities and they also perform the cutting and scaring the skin with their knife and other sharp objects. But according to Zakaria Ismail, a local barber who inherited the practice from their parents says tribal marks are on the verge of becoming a history. On a scale of 1 to 100, 70% of people have stopped putting tribal marks on their children. They hardly come to us for the marks. It is fast fading. As tribal marks are fast fading, wearing tattoo on skin is now replacing tribal marks among young people. Bella Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. This is the news of our on Trust TV. Business, foreign and sports. When we return, please do stay with us. This is Trust TV. Documenting the Nigerian story. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us on News Hour tonight. Now in Plateau State, at least three people were reportedly killed in separate attacks in villages within the Basa local government area. Delhi Trust guarded that the first incident occurred on Thursday in Kwaraye village, while the second happened on Friday night in Kwarenke village, both of Basa local government area. Samuel Jugo, the National Publicity Secretary of the Irigwe Development Association, believed the attacks were a reprisal for the killing of two herders in the area. There have been repeated attacks and counter-attacks between the farming community and herders in Basa local government area, resulting in numerous deaths. Now, our reporter in the state, Adomosa, is joining us via phone call to give us an update on the situation. Good evening, Adomosa. Thank you for joining us tonight on the News Hour. Uh, good evening, Chiamaka. All right, so can you give us an update on what's happening in Basa local government area of Plateau State? Uh, well, at the moment, uh, normalcy has been restored, uh, but uh, the fear still lingers uh, among the residents of uh, the affected communities. Uh, it is a tradition that uh, whenever there is any attack, particularly on a particular community, uh, the fear will still linger among the people of uh, the other community. I spoke to uh, the spokesperson of uh, the two communities, that is uh, the uh, Fulani communities and uh, Edigo communities, but are calling on the people to remain calm, and uh, they have reported all the cases to security agencies uh, for further action. 
and those who have been injured during the incident are currently receiving treatment at the Jose University Teaching Hospital. So at the moment, everything has been uh, calm. So everybody is going about this uh, normal activity. But don't forget, like I have said it, uh, the fear still lingers among the uh, people of uh, the affected communities, particularly uh, around the uh, local government area. Right, Adam Musa, do you have an idea of the reason for this attack? Well, uh, it is uh, a tradition, like uh, we always say it, uh, there has been problem between uh, farming communities and the herders. And there has been accusation of uh, attacks and counter-attacks between the two communities. Whenever a particular group uh, is attacked, so the next thing you hear is uh, a kind of accusation against the other community. That is, uh, if the attack is launched on the Fulani communities, the Fulani will now accuse the Irigwe, particularly if it happens in Basa, because Basa is where you have the Hadas and the Irigwe. So, which is different from if you go to Bari Keladi, where you have the problem is between the Fulani and the Birom. So, the same thing if you go to Mangu, where you have the problem between the Fulani and Magabu. So, uh, in Basa, we cannot say that this is the reason because we know that there has been uh, accusation and counter-accusation. There have been attacks and counter-attacks between the two communities. But all we know that on Thursday, there was a report that uh, two herders were killed, and then, or rather, two were, were, were shot, but only one of them that uh, died, then one was taken to uh, Jose University Teaching Hospital. Then on Friday, we also had another report that uh, two members of Irigui were also killed. And up to this moment, the security agencies are yet to uh, maybe uh, give us any uh, uh, report or uh, statement with regard to what happened uh, that is uh, in the attack, that is the first and the second attack. So we cannot uh, completely or independently say that this is the reason. But uh, it okay. is very obvious that there was an attack on uh, uh, Thursday and there was another attack on what uh, Friday. Okay. Thank you so much, Adam, for joining us tonight on the news. I want to give us an update on what's happening in Basa local government area of Plateau State. Okay, thank you for having me. Moving to business, the Securities and Exchange Commission has issued its Framework on Banking Sector Capitalization Program 2024. Now, the framework was released on the Commission's website on Friday. This follows the Central Bank of Nigeria's March announcement of fresh minimum capital requirements for all banks in Nigeria to achieve a trillion dollar economy. Accordingly, the SEX framework serves as a comprehensive guide for banks and holding companies and market participants to navigate the recapitalization program effectively. Consequently, the SEC said it would charge banks one million naira as a penalty for an application returned for being incomplete. Still in business, the Nigeria Electricity Regulatory Commission (NERC) has announced the approval of 21 billion naira for 11. 11 electricity distribution companies discussed to provide meters for customers. This announcement was made in NERC's order on the operationalization of tranche A of the Presidential Metering Initiative under the Framework of Meter Acquisition Fund. According to NERC, it introduced the meter asset provider MARP regulations 2018 and subsequently the meter asset provider and national mass metering regulations in 2021 to address metering challenges in the Nigerian electricity supply industry. NERC said that the regulations provided several options for metering end-use customers, but the interventions, though significant, had not resulted in the closure of the national metering gap, which currently stood in excess of 7 million customers. Still in business, the NGX Insurance Index let the losers during the three days trading due to the Salah holiday. The sector fell by 1.32% week on week. The figure contributed 
1.8% decline in the broader market indices. The NGX 30 index followed with a 0.16% decline and the NGX banking index fell by 0.04% week on week. Conversely, the NGX oil and gas index led the gainers, rising by 0.35% week on week, followed by the NGX consumer goods index, which increased by 0.29%. Specifically, sell pressure witnessed in the decline sectors led to negative price movements in the stocks of VFD Group, AICO, Insurance and AXA Mansad. Consequently, NGX Osha Index and market capitalization depreciated by 0.18% to close the week at 99,743.05 basis points and 56.424 trillion naira respectively. Nigeria, Ghana and 61 other countries are some of the countries facing food poverty, a report by the United Nations Student Fund UNICEF has disclosed. In the latest report for June 2024, the global body also listed Afghanistan, Bangladesh, China, Cote d'Ivoire and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Others are Ethiopia, India, Indonesia, Myanmar, Niger, Pakistan, the Philippines, Somalia, South Africa, Uganda, the United Republic of Tanzania, and Yemen. According to the report, one in four children is living in severe child food poverty in early childhood, amounting to 181 million children under five years of age. The body defined child food poverty as children's inability to access and consume a nutritious and diverse diet in early childhood. And away from Nigeria, Togo authorities said they will lift a suspension on accreditation for foreign journalists imposed in April after a highly contested constitutional reform. The High Authority for Audiovisual and Communication, HAC, suspended accreditations before legislative elections that saw President Fauri Nassim Bey's ruling party extend his family's political dynasty. Hawk has said the suspension was because of serious failures in the coverage of Togo's politics by French media and issues with the French journalist who was expelled from Togo. Reporters Without Borders had denounced the suspension as a violation of freedom of information. Nassim Bey's Union for the Republic Party won 108 of the 113 parliament seats in the election in a small West African state. Under the constitutional reform, the presidency becomes a largely ceremonial post elected by lawmakers. Power shifts to a new president of the Council of Ministers. A 21-year-old protester died after being hit by tear gas canister during protests in Kenya this week. A Human Rights Commission official said on Saturday in the second fatality resulting from the youth-led demonstrations. Led largely by young Kenyans who have live-streamed the demonstrations, the protests against tax hikes have been galvanized by widespread discontent over President William Ruto's economic policies. Thursday's demonstrations in Nairobi were mostly peaceful, but officers fired tear gas and water cannon throughout the day in an attempt to disperse protesters near Parliament. According to a Kenyan Human Rights Commission official, 21-year-old Evans Kiratu was hit by a tear gas canister during the demonstrations. The rallies began in Nairobi on Tuesday before spreading nationwide, with protesters calling for a national strike on June 25th. The Independent Policing Oversight Authority watchdog said on Friday that it had documented the death of a 29-year-old man allegedly as a result of police shooting. To sports where the president of the Nigerian Football Federation, NFF Ibrahim Guso, will present the Nigerian Premier Football League NPFL trophy to eight Lugu Rangers in Joss on Sunday. Rangers claimed their eighth NPFL title after dismissing Bendel Shores 2 0 last weekend. Their opponent in the March Day 38 encounter, Gumbi United, have already been relegated to the Nigerian National League NNL. NPFL Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Benga Elebeleye and Davidson Owumi are expected to be at the stadium for the game. Top officials of the NFF and NPFL are also expected to witness the occasion. 
Rangers have already announced that they will fly the squad alongside the trophy back to Inugu from Jaws aboard the chartered aircraft after the game. The Flying Antelopes will hold the trophy presentation in Enugu on Monday. Telling sports, world record holder in the women's 100 meter huddles, Toby Amoson on Friday withdrew from the ongoing African Athletics Championship in Douala, Cameroon, due to illness. Amoson had arrived at Douala on Thursday morning alongside other members of the Nigerian contingent with no sign of illness. But after falling ill in the night, Sports Ministry's medical personnel attached the AFN team to Douala advised her to take a rest. Amazon came top in the women's 100 meters hurdles in 2018 in Asaba and two years ago in Mauritius. Had she competed and won, Amazon would have joined Maria Usifo and Gloria Lozier as the only athletes with three consecutive African titles in the women's 100 meter hurdles. Nigeria's Adobe Tabugo, Tabugo has already qualified for the final. Team Nigeria won two gold medals on the first of the competition on Friday. And that's it for News Hour tonight on Trust TV. For more of our news, programs and documentaries, please do want to follow us on all our social media platforms and on our YouTube live stream. I am Chiamaka Mwafo. Don't forget to maintain good hygiene and stay safe. Good night and thanks for joining us. The Trust News Center, this is the News Hour.